Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and we're back with another set of deep space updates. I'm out of my office and in the backyard because, well, uh, apparently Amy decided that we needed to have some work done in the house. So I figured he didn't want this, the sound of saws and hammers and stuff in the background. But anyway, let's get down to talking about the space news. And honestly, it's, it's been more than a week. It's been you know, about 10 days and we've only had one launch. Having said that, it was quite a launch. It was the Transporter 5 launch for SpaceX. This is a rideshare launch, and it was carrying a lot of satellites, something like you know, 50, 60 satellites. I don't know the exact count, but it's hard to tell because, of course, there are people that buy the ports on the launch vehicle, and then those then you know, resell their space to other companies. So there's like a Momentus, Exo Launch, Spaceflight, uh, Sherpa, Spaceflight Inc., Deorbit, Terran Orbital, like Momentus, they made their first launch of their uh, Vigoride stage, which is supposed to uh, be a, like a satellite deployment system on its own. Uh, Deorbit launched a couple of satellites. There was like a usual, like, you know, academic Earth observation satellites and the crypto focused satellite, which I'm sure will, uh, you know, be very effective. Uh, there were five satellites from ISI, which uh, they do, you know, synthetic aperture radar. Terran Orbital had a launch for NASA, which uh, included like a couple of uh, op satellites that were supposed to demonstrate proximity operation stuff. And uh, I think then most interestingly, there was a spacecraft or it wasn't even deployed. So NanoRacks, in collaboration with Maxar, they launched the Mars Outpost demo. And part of that is to basically show manufacturing techniques in space. So on board this 100 kilogram payload, they had a, an arm that would saw, would cut metal using like a friction milling. Basically, they want to be able to demonstrate they can cut steel and aluminium and other stuff without ge de generating huge amounts of debris in zero G because that's the kind of thing you need for in-space manufacturing. So yeah, that was the launch. Of course, was a return to launch site. It launched them into a polar uh, sun-synchronous orbit, I believe. And that meant that it had to do the dog leg, but the booster came back and it landed perfectly. And there was all sorts of really cool videos of that. But of course, that wasn't the most important the landing of the week. After all, SpaceX lands boosters all the time. Boeing, however, landed their Starliner after a few days docked at the International Space Station, demonstrating the capabilities that it will need to progress towards the actual flight with crew on board. So as far as I know, the landing went great. It looked cool. Um, you know, it basically made a perfect touchdown on land, which is obviously a preferable situation if you have seasickness. But then again, if you have seasickness, then, you know, you're probably not going to be in space. Uh, yeah, so the mission looks to have been mostly a success. There are a few minor problems. There was obviously the two uh, orbital maneuvering thrusters, which failed during the early orbit insertion. Um, there were a couple of smaller thrusters that failed at one point and then were recovered. There was a problem with a cooling loop. And... The thing is, so they'll probably have to figure those out before they decide whether to proceed towards a, a human-rated launch. It's, I mean, of course, some of this stuff is going to be harder to debug than it otherwise might be because the Starliner drops the service module and therefore the thrusters that went wrong have all burned up in the atmosphere. Anyway, I fully expect this to turn into a, an operational spacecraft by the end of the week. Uh, the sticky valves, by the way, that were seen in the previous launch attempt no problem, no factor on this mission. The real question is, now, do they need to continue the entire suite of mitigating uh, operations, including like purging with dry nitrogen and stuff that they, they've previously done? Anyway, uh, Boca Chica, uh, yes, as you may have known, may, as you may have heard, yesterday was again the deadline for the FAA to, to present its environmental assessment. And of course, they delayed it, but they delayed it by only two weeks. We're officially into the two more weeks phase, a, a meme which never gets old. So yeah, um, we do know that the Fisheries and Wildlife Service, they completed their internal assessment and they say they would approve it but SpaceX are required to take certain mitigating, uh, uh, you know, actions into you know, into hand. They have to include, they have to actually employ someone on site to make sure that they're not affecting wildlife and things like that. But uh, even in anticipation of yesterday, there was a group of uh, like tribes and various groups that uh, started or opened up a lawsuit against like the Texas Land Board or whatever that, who is in charge of this saying that they're, you know, that 
They are guilty of dereliction of duty by uh, allowing the beach uh, access to be closed to this public area for, for so much. So I, I don't know if that's going to go anywhere, but again, it's I, my point is that this is going to be a litigated decision one way or another. And the only way to make it happen really fast is to make sure that all the groundwork has been done and no lawyer can claim that there is a slight problem with the work that was used to take make that conclusion. And that's why I totally understand the FAA taking their sweet ass time over this because we always knew it was going to be difficult. Um, anyway, moving to other uh, bigger plans, NASA has apparently internally, oh, they've announced, it's been mentioned that NASA is reopening and reconsidering old plans for space-based solar power. Now, this was a big thing that NASA was looking at in the 1970s when, of course, they were looking for other big projects that they could do. The idea is you have big solar panels up in geostationary orbit, like square kilometers of solar panels getting perfect, you know, unfiltered sunlight and then using microwave beaming to send that power back to Earth. So this obviously never happened because space got too expensive and there wasn't enough money going around. But NASA is now sort of taking another look at those plans. They're not going to come up with a whole set of new plans. They're just going to say, well, OK, what happens if we take modern technology and apply it to these, you know, modern solar cells, modern launch capabilities? Because back then, one of the sticking points was the space shuttle could maybe launch 25 tons into low Earth orbit. Now, with a fully reusable vehicle potentially on the horizon in the coming decade that can launch hundreds of tons, it may be time to reconsider this approach to powering the world. On the other hand, powering uh, ingenuity on Mars has got to the point where they're not able to fly right now. So ingenuity, it did complete its longest flight yet, its fastest flight yet. There's a great video of that. They've spent the last few weeks downlinking or transferring all that video off the memory card because it doesn't have enough power right now to charge itself up to keep its heaters running overnight. So Ingenuity is basically parked and is hunkering down for the winter, hoping that in a few months the sun will get high enough in the sky again to get you know, deliver enough power so that it can begin flight operations again. There's a pretty good chance that it fails before then, but there was a pretty good chance the ingenuity wouldn't even make two test flights, right? So I'm hopeful. Uh, I hope we see ingenuity returning to form later in the year. Uh, over in the Rocket Lab have taken delivery of the Capstone spacecraft. That is going to be the NASA spacecraft, which is going to go into a near rectilinear halo orbit. So this is going to be launched on a Rocket Lab Electron. It's going to have the big photon second stage with the Hypercurie 3D printed engine. That is like a their, their bigger engine that uses electrically powered pumps to generate, you know, to increase the chamber pressure and get more thrust and more efficiency. So that will launch, I think June 13th is currently the earliest launch. And it will you know, go into low Earth orbit and then over like a week it will ex, you know, ex elongate, eccentrify its orbit until it gets out to the moon and then the spacecraft will go into a near rectilinear halo orbit and demonstrate that you can in fact put something in there and keep it there for a long time because NASA wants to do that with the Lunar Gateway. Uh, another piece of hardware that has been shipped is Relativity Space have shipped their first booster to Florida in preparation for a launch campaign this summer. So this is the biggest 3D printed a uh, metal object. I don't know. There's probably bigger, like, you know, houses and things that are 3D printed. But this is a 3D printed rocket. There's obviously a few parts which it's much easier to buy machine. You know, if you're buying a bearing, you don't 3D print a bearing because you can just buy them off the shelf and they're better. But uh, a, a large part of this thing has been 3D printed. They're already printing the next one. Back in March, they shipped a space a stage two off to Stennis to perform testing on it. And I presume that's gone well enough that they're continuing with their launch campaign. Um, OK, Space Force made an announcement about eight launches that the eight that the, the, that many eight. <laughs> Boy, yes. Real big brain up here. Uh, eight launches, so there'll be five from the United Launch Alliance and three from SpaceX. All five of the ULA launches are going to be on Vulcan Centaur from the East Coast. There's a GPS satellite, 
uh, wideband global satcom satellites that's going to geostationary orbit and then there's three classified missions we don't know what they are but i'm sure they're going to be fun spacex uh they have three missions they are going to launch usf ussf 124 which is a space force and missile defense agency spacecraft so presumably uh, involved in monitoring for missile launches there's ussf 62 which is a polar orbit military weather satellite and there's also something called the sda which is a new communications network using salt small sats by the sound of things now we don't have a full insight into the launch cost but it is notable that for these launches the per launch cost is lower for United Launch Alliance with their new Vulcan uh, compared to SpaceX with their Falcon 9, which is much more established. Uh, the Psyche mission ha is getting, well, getting ready to launch later this year. Its launch was set for August 1st, but during ground testing, they found some problems. So they've now pushed the launch date back six weeks while they try to address these and remedy them. Obviously, you still want to get it out in time for a launch window. Uh, on in terms of uh, asteroids, by the way, uh, one of my favorite groups, the B612 Foundation, they made an announcement that they, they are now actually finding asteroids and they're doing it using uh, an interesting new way. So uh, there's something called THOR, right? Trackletless Heliocentric Orbit Recovery. And uh, this is something I'm kind of fascinated by. This is sort of... Um, what they did was they applied this new algorithm to a bunch of data, I believe, from the Dark Energy Telescope, the Dark Energy Survey, and they found something like 100 asteroids that had previously not been found by previous missions. So when you're doing an asteroid survey, the best way to do it is to take a couple of photos, you know, like six, a few hours apart. And the idea is that over a few hours, asteroids will move from one place to the next on your photos, uh, you know, in a roughly straight line. And then you can take that straight line and figure out where it might be a few days from now. So it makes it easier to join observations a couple of days apart. Now, Thor basically says, well, okay, if we can't get two images within a, a few hours of each other, we can throw a lot more computational power at it and still correlate these things because they're on heliocentric orbits. The reason you don't do this is just because you need huge amounts of power. But these days, with cloud services and elastic computing and the ability to you know, schedule jobs for when there's low demand and therefore low costs, there are a whole bunch of new problems that can be solved with you know, this computer power that's available. And this is one example. And this has like interesting applications when you consider the Vera Rub Rubin Telescope, the Large Scale Synoptic Survey Telescope, which well, one of its jobs, well, its main job is to look at variability in the sky. So it fo surveys the entire sky every few days and looks for things like variable stars and, uh, you know, supernova and stuff like that. And one of its jobs is to find asteroids. And to do that, it means it needs to image each part of the, each of the sky you know, twice a night. And that complicates the scheduling. So in theory, they could replan their entire uh, observation scheduling and use this computationally intensive process because there's only one LSST, but there's thousands of computers sitting in a data center somewhere just twiddling their thumbs waiting to do some job, right? Uh, so it could actually help improve the amount of data that you could get out of a telescope like LSST. Anyway, um, yeah, I just, I just found that kind of fascinating. And yeah, they also called me an internet rocket scientist. Oh, oh okay. I mean, I called myself an internet rocket scientist and they were like, sure, I'll, they'll do that. Speaking of variable stars, there was one other news result that came out or scientific result that came out um, in nature. So the Himawari geostationary orbit, uh, you know, it's a weather satellite in geostationary orbit. It's been taking images, you know, all the time. Every, every 15, every 10, 15 minutes, turns out some smart people figured out that right on the edge of the earth it will sometimes see stars right bright stars will be visible next to the earth and specifically betelgeuse if you remember that a few years ago it had this dimming and there was a lot of discussion as to whether this dimming was due to um, a dust cloud over the star or a cool spot or like a an expansion of the entire star things like that well a team looked at data that was being produced by this weather satellite and found every time the star appeared just next to the Earth 
and they did photometry on it. They figured out its brightness, and now they have a whole history of Betelgeuse's brightness, you know, in the run-up to this event, during this event. And not only that, Himawari is a weather satellite, so its camera works in like 10 different bands in the, into the deep infrared. So they have a really wide spectrum, and they get all these infrared observations that would normally require a space-based telescope, and nobody happened to have that much in the way of space-based assets pointing at it. So their conclusion is, why not both? They think that the results are actually consistent with two smaller effects, you know, a dust cloud and a uh, cool spot, both combining to create the big dimming that we saw a couple of years ago. So anyway, uh, that's the, that's, I think that's the news for the week. One thing is, in, but probably by the time this video is published, NASA will announce the, uh, the winners or the contractors who are going to build the spacesuits for the next generation spacesuits for Artemis and things like that. There are a huge number of possible companies that have applied or, or have expressed interest. So we're going to find this out in the next few days, and I'll probably have a video for that about that very, very soon too, because the result will definitely be very important, especially given the age of the EMUs that are in use on the International Space Station. Okay, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.